Um, and I would like to hand it over to Allison as well. I know you have a topic to present. I'm going to talk about um, sensory needs in the lesson and kind of, there's a lot of it's been touched on, so I'm going to kind of adapt to that. So the first one is called proprioception, which is your sense of movement and action, basically like sensing where your body parts are in space. If you close your eyes and lift your hand over your head, you know that your hand is still there. Um, but some students with developmental disabilities might not have a good sense of proprioception. They might have to think through every movement that they do, and we don't always know that. That can present itself as a child that looks uncoordinated. They might seem too rough, like they don't know their own strength. Um, they might fall easily, run into things. Um, I had a I had a therapy client one time that it was just working on getting her to reach for things, and she would reach and like miss side side over under. She knew what she wanted to do, but she didn't have the sensory ability to detect where her arms and legs were in space. Um, the next sense is called vestibular sense, which is essentially your sense of balance. Um, that one's pretty easy to understand. The last one is called interoception, which is sensing the functions of your internal organs. So we can detect when we're hungry, when we need to use the restroom, things like that. Um, especially in children with autism, they might have an impaired sense of interoception. They might have difficulty knowing how they're feeling, they might have a heightened sense of how they're feeling, and they might not be able to tell us that. So they might have a heightened sense of what's going on in their digestive tract, which doesn't really sound that pleasant to me. <laughs> you know, so that can be kind of distracting from their environment. So children can have sensory needs that we might have no clue about, and it's just something to keep in mind um, as you're teaching them. There's two kind of categories of children with sensory needs. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, sensory needs, sensory processing disorder can occur with any type of disability, but it's really common with autism and ADHD. So there's two kinds of categories that we put them into, and obviously they're not strict categories. We have sensory seekers. These are students that will look and seek out extra stimuli in their environment. They might appear fidgety or hyperactive. They're the ones that maybe don't want to sit in their chair for as long. Um, and it's easy to kind of like mentally label them like, oh, it's that kid that just can't sit still. But really, they just might need movement, that vestibular input or that proprioceptive input in order to focus. Um, I had a therapy client that if he was moving around the room, walking, bouncing, he could focus and complete tasks so much better than if I had to ha have him sit at a desk. And so that's what I did. Obviously, this is a little bit different when you're teaching an instrument, depending on the instrument you're teaching, but something to keep in mind. It might not be lack of attention. It might not be lack of discipline. It might just be a sensory need. Um, some students will be sensory avoidant, and I think this is more of the kind of the classic example you think of, students that get overstimulated or get overwhelmed by stimuli in their environment. So uh, they might be sensitive to light. They might be sensitive to sound. They might be sensitive to certain smells. You know, for example, I'm sitting in this room right now, I don't smell a thing. But for a student with autism, there might be something that they smell that I don't smell that's bothering them. You know, that kind of a thing. Um, overstimulation can lead to anxiety, which some people talked about, which can lead to meltdowns and things like that. So something to be aware of. Um, the other thing to think about is when the child is coming to lessons, for the first time, they're in a whole new sensory environment. So it might take them a few weeks, maybe even a few months, just to get used to being in a new building, a new room, with a new person. Um, that's something that they're going to have to adapt to. Um, and that in itself might be a goal, that they simply can just be in the lesson in a new environment for 30 minutes to an hour. Um, so sensory, we all have sensory needs, even if we don't have a diagnosis. We all need an ideal level of sensory input to keep us alert and ready to learn or work, but not overwhelmed and not drowsy. If you think about it, if you wake up in the morning, you might drink a cup of coffee to get you ready for your day. If you're going to work, you're going to want a room that's well lit, because if it's dim, you're probably going to get sleepy and you're not going to do your best work. Um, a lot of kids with sensory processing disorder only spend a short period each day in their optimal, it's called a state of arousal. 
the state of mind you need to be able to focus and learn, which Meredith talked about a little bit. So think about, consider that too, right? Like you're seeing them a half an hour or an hour out of their whole day, depending on what the sensory needs are, that you might not have gotten the optimal time. It's unfortunate. We all wish we got that time with them, but it doesn't always happen that way. Um, I'm just gonna give you some practical tips here. I'm gonna try and go over the ones that are a little different from other people have mentioned. Um, free play is really a really good sensory sensory strategy, giving them time to just, if they're a piano student, just play freely on the piano. Mm -hmm. um, if you notice them getting overwhelmed, giving them time to calm back down before resuming instruction. Um, I like to use a lot of small percussion instruments to work on musical concepts like tempo and dynamics. It's a way to get them away from the bench. They can move around and be successful and still learn something while doing it. Um, you know, these are just ideas. Like if you wanted, if you're gonna do your theory lesson, can you do it with tactile objects instead of pencil and paper? Can you teach a component of your lesson standing up instead of sitting down? Things of that nature. Um, I'm gonna kind of jump to a different topic we talked about the parent relationships briefly, um, and everything that was said was wonderful. I just wanted to, other thing I wanted to add on is to give these parents lots of grace mm -hmm. because I've worked in the home environment and the challenges that parents of special needs students face are just, you just wouldn't even know. Like you just, it's amazing what they do for their kids, getting them to the lesson, being in the lesson may have been an accomplishment. It may, this might be the first, typical environment that their student has had success in that's not a therapy session or a school. Um, and so you might have a day where you feel like, I didn't really get done what I wanted to do. You might have a month where you feel like, I didn't really get done what I thought I wanted to do. But for that family, it might just be an accomplishment yeah. that they're there, you know. Um, so give these parents a lot of grace. That they want to go. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, parents are dealing with all kinds of, there might be medical appointments, therapy appointments, fighting with, fighting to get services. You know, if they have more than one child with special need, then whoop, you know, that's a lot. So I think that's all I had to say at the moment. But yeah. Wonderful. Thank yeah, thank you so much, Allison. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And um, Aiden, I wanted to ask you as well if you had anything that you'd like to contribute or we can move into some question and answer um, and have all of our panelists sort of participate. Yeah, I could talk a little bit. Yeah. Sure. So just echoing everything everyone else said, very good information. Um, so I was thinking about what I wanted to say and what are the most important things in my mind for working with um, adults and children with special needs. And I was thinking, um, seeing through the diagnosis, you know, it's very easy to get stuck in a diagnosis and symptoms, and then that's a set of expectations that you put on somebody, where um, every child will look different. You know, you say a child with autism could look drastically different than another child with autism. So you really just want to be open and get to know that child, which I believe was mentioned by a couple people, rather than expecting they're going to behave like this or do this get to know their individual needs and what they want to do. And then with that is uh, the lesson is for them, right? You know, it's not our time. The parents are paying for it, but the lesson is really for the child. So if they don't want to do something, that's okay. You know, you don't want to force anyone to do anything, but it's okay to push a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not glass, they're not going to get broken. So it's okay to encourage and push if you think they could do it. Just if you're doing that, you really want to be aware of their physical reactions. Are they tightening up? Are they shutting down? Are they getting agitated? And then you could talk to them about that. Be like, hey, I notice this might be difficult. And validate the experience they're having and take it from where they're at rather than trying to set another expectation on them. Mm -hmm. And then with that, um, I would say, say no as little as possible. You know, at school and at home, they're probably getting told no, no, no all day. So how do you set boundaries without being an authoritarian, right? So if someone is jumping up on the bench, it's very easy to react and be like, hey, no, you can't do that. But I'd say go towards them and ask, why are they doing this? You know, be like, oh, is the bench helping you play the piano? No, if it's not, maybe we should get down so you don't get hurt rather than saying no. 
or my one um, student will take their phone out. And it's easy to be like, hey, that's not the time or place. But I'll ask and be like, oh, are you, do you want to show me something? You're trying to play a song for me. And if not, then I'll be like, oh, maybe you could show me later. Or we could talk about it later rather than just automatically putting the wall up. Because I feel once you put that wall up, they shut down. Yeah. Then you're... They mirror with the wall. Yeah. <laughs> then you're with the wall. Then you're not their friend anymore and they don't care. So you really just want to go towards them and be interested in what they're doing, what purpose anything they're doing has, and work with them. Mm -hmm. I think that's all on my mind. Thanks, Aiden. Yeah. yeah. Um, that did bring up a question that I have, and it'll uh, bounce a little bit off of your question, Killian. But I'm thinking of a student in particular I know who has been here for several years. Um, this particular student has um, autism. And I know that um, the parent may or may not be as involved as could be helpful in the lesson. And so uh, when they are speaking to uh, the teacher, I know that they, they have a lot of expectations and they're wondering maybe why you're focusing on X, Y, Z in a lesson and why their child is not moving to the level that maybe the parent would, would expect them to be at. I would Angie. love to speak to that Thanks. because I've had this recently. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have an autism student and the mother, you know, it came around for the recital for June and she's like, oh, I wanted to sign up my child, blah, 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 blah. And I said, oh, I said, you know, that's a great idea. I said, um, here's what I see that I think would be helpful to reach that goal. And then we talked about what the expectation would be. I said, usually in a recital, we, uh, the student is, you know, walks on the stage, sits on the bench, goes this way, sits on the bench, puts their hands in their lap. And I kind of go over what the expectation is. And it was very quick, she understood you know, he's not curving his fingers. He's not gonna be able to go around and sit on the bench and you know, participate at that, in that level for the moment. I said, but you know what? I tell you what, let's take our lesson time and I'm gonna start showing him how, you know, when we sit down on the piano bench, cause he would always kind of like wanna sit sideways or keep his legs up on the bench or something like that. I said, let's work on this step and let's see how he does. Mm -hmm. And then she was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. You know, it wasn't even about <clears throat> the music or the song, <clears throat> excuse me, that he really couldn't perform yet, but it was about the expectation of what does a recital entail and what would be expected at a recital. And so I think um, just making it very clear, but in a, in a kind way, okay, yeah, I think that's a great goal for your child, let's look at the steps it's going to take to get there, and don't overwhelm them. Because they don't know. They how don't know. They don't. So they don't know. Right. Like, oh, yeah. I see what my ask actually is. Uh, right. right. Because exactly. they don't know what the steps are involved, and they don't. Maybe they've never even. Maybe the child hasn't ever even attended a recital. And then I say, well, you know what? I think it would be great for him to come and see and, and get involved in seeing the experience and seeing other children doing that. And then there's this expectation, even in his mind, even if he doesn't understand everything, he will understand that, okay, everybody's sitting quietly. Oh, wow, while this person is on stage. And then I have another, a great success story of a child that's autistic that I've had a couple of years and the parents wanted him right away to jump into a recital. And I was like, you know, let's take our time. Here's some things that I would like to hone in on. And now he does play in recitals and he is, he is considered pretty, pretty high on the spectrum of autism, but he is able to accomplish that. And, and he gets a trophy and he just smile, you would not, the smile is so big and the parents are so pleased because he's accomplishing something that, you know, he's not been able to do in any other type of sports or in any other way. So I, yeah, I think breaking it down and helping the parent realize what is that expectation and then, but, but be very positive about it and that here's some steps we can take to get them there. Totally. 
And it may take a couple of years. It may not happen at Christmas. It may be the next spring before this is gonna happen, but yeah. it's there and, there and then that expectation is. Well, and you could carry that over too because sometimes people will sign up and say, I want my child to learn fur lease, like the first day. And yeah. you're like, your kid is five. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And maybe it's not even a special needs situation, but it seems clear that the parents' expectations of the results of what you have to offer are a little bit out of line with what is reality and right. what is accomplishable in a, you know, 15, 30 minute lesson. Because some of the youngest students that we have only do 15 minute lessons. Like, they're, all you can really accomplish is setting up a routine and being like, here's the piano. Okay, bye. You know, so... Um, uh, yeah, I think just giving expectations and maybe mm -hmm. even because they just know this would be a really great goal or I did this as a kid, let's get them there. Maybe they don't know that the, what, took it, what it took them to get there is different for their kid. Right. Or right. maybe their kid actually can't accomplish in the way that they're thinking that goal. But I think we could give them success in these other areas and maybe redirect them okay. a little bit. Is that I think that's great, Jennifer. And I would, did want to say one other thing. So I have a new student who is five, and um, but they're so accomplished so quickly. And so he's only been with me about half a year. But I said, your child can play this in a recital. Like they are, are ready for, for this experience if you think they can handle it or whatever. And then the parent came back to me and said, no, we, that's not what we want for him right now. It's a really big setting. He's never performed before in his life. And so he's an older child, the oldest of the family. So there's already this expectation being the firstborn. And so for them, they didn't want him to do it unless they knew he could do it, but they don't know because he's never had this experience. So then you think of another way that they could have a performance experience yeah, yeah. that's not on the big right. stage, but maybe you bring them into another class setting where they're able to perform. Like I have students who might come to my preschool class who are eight and perform for my two and three year olds. And then it's like, wow, they did that. Like maybe one day I'll do that. So maybe find or provide some type of extra performance for them where they can feel that accomplishment, but it's not in that quite formal setting. And I've found that a lot of, um, since we've done the virtual recitals the last yes. couple of years, a lot of students and parents will respond to the idea of a video performance because yes. they can keep it. It's like a, an album. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. I will film it on the iPad or on my phone or whatever has the best camera and then cut it together with a little opening and a little closing and then just send them the file or like upload it to where they can go see it on YouTube because you can do unlisted if you don't want it to be out there for the whole world to see. Um, and a lot of them are like, oh, yeah, or like, make it visible. I want to share it with all of my, blast it on social media because my kid's amazing. Mm -hmm. But they're not ready for the stage or the audience. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of give them the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. I have two other questions. <laughs> Great. Which are very, Absolutely. Which are very different. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess the first is in regards to like stimuli, being overstimulated. Are there some things that I guess, no matter like who my student is, like is there like a certain way I can curate my studio? Like, cause like when I think of peaceful environment, I'm thinking like dim lighting, the sound of trickling water in the background, <laughs> you know, maybe there's like a little singing bowl or like a flute, you know, like a song, right? That's how like I perceive yeah. that environment yeah. being neurotypical. Yeah. Is there like, and again, it's a spectrum and like you went over, there's like all different ways like we can like experience being overstimulated or not stimulated enough. So mm -hmm. like, is there sort of like a, I guess one size fits all, maybe sort of light way of like this kind of lighting will work no matter who I'm with. This like uh, is a list of like no's. Like I have some students who are freaked out by the sounds of like piano when it's loud. I've like mm -hmm. found, mm -hmm. they're like, ha, ah, like they literally jump and I'm like, I just played a chord, you know, right. Right. are there a certain like, things like in general with even with like my kids who are neurotypical right yeah. where it's like I could just say this is the way my studio is now and it works best for everybody is there like any anything there that could maybe be that is there a one-size-fits-all approach I'm sad to tell you no not <laughs> <laughs> but um especially because like here right we we have a physical defined location you know yeah 
Um, I would say one of the things is like I like to like minimize distracting clutter uh-huh. and like keep things that are like visually flashy like hidden until like, uh-huh. you need need them or they want them. Um, I think a biggest element, especially when it comes to like you talked about the sound, mm-hmm. is like giving the child as much reasonable control as they can over the level of sound. Okay. You know, as much as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, one size fits all. Yeah, because again, like lighting is hard. That's a hard one because like yeah. you're in well, an I mean, office building, right? Like, like you're. Yeah, yeah that's and just, like, not that's have a good point. Yeah. yeah, that would be that's a good strategy. I have um, one student that brings a pillow with him every week and sits on it. Yeah. I don't know why. That's important to him. <laughs> and he likes to carry it. So I'm like, oh, you brought your pillow? Great. Bring it in. And we don't have a soft bench in our room. I know some benches have, like, padding or whatever. So that, I think, is enough. And then after he's – you know, especially for students with autism or other students where the routine is super important, like, if they come in and it's the same every time, roughly speaking, where things are in the room – what you say to them, the flow of the time, where the piano is, that's enough like to make them feel safe. Oh, it's the same as it was before. The first couple lessons, maybe they don't feel that way because it's all new. The more you go, they're like, well, the lighting in there is just how the lighting in there is. You know, so like in general, we don't have a lot of control over flu- fluorescent lighting. We could change it a little bit if you wanted to bring in other things, but sometimes you're not in the same studio every day, you know, and so what you can do being a portable teacher um, you could either bring in a pillow or maybe a blanket. I don't know if you feel like there's a student that has issues with temperature or body regulation. That can happen. Um, if you want to just have a couple of those things in like your kit, just in case. But also encouraging parents and, and um, students, like if this is something you need to have with you, bring it. I have really young students that will bring a stuffy in. And I'll be like, yeah, your toy can come. Do they want to play piano? And that will sometimes be the only thing that gets them excited. I wasn't going to do piano, but Barbie can come play piano. Great. So bring it, but involve the item in the lesson and then make it a time where, okay, great. We're going to put that down for this next part, but they can come play the game with us at the end, or they can color with us at the end or something. It's a little bit like preschool, I guess, in the, te- in, or like kindergarten in the sense of like anything goes, but at the same time you get to say what does and doesn't go. Does that make sense? So give them the option to bring in an item up that gives them comfort, that gives you less to worry about, but then also opens that communication pathway, especially for young kids or students with really severe issues where they're like, this is my safety item, I need this item. Because that's, that's a really common trait with autism that they'll have like a favorite toy or favorite object that they carry um, that they just want to touch and that will make them feel safe. And so maybe they are able to sit at the piano for 15 minutes, but only if they can see that like Mr. Walrus is sitting there too. Okay, bring Mr. Walrus every week. I, where's Mr. Walrus? I missed him today, you know, or whatever. So um, I think it's just learning, again, the needs of your student, but then communicating, hey, is there something that you're not seeing? And, and maybe you'll know, like if there's a sensory issue happening and you don't understand why, and maybe the student doesn't either, but you know it's in the environment. Be like, is it this? Is this making you uncomfortable? Oh, I played that too loud. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, it's annoying in one sense to have to have a different approach with every single student because you're like, oh my gosh, I have like 50 students. How am I going to keep track of this? So make notes, but also leave it up to them as much as you can. Does that help? Yeah. 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 I like that, Jennifer. That's really good. And um, Allison, what you said too. I think and one little piece I'd add is is for you too, what makes you feel comfortable as the teacher? Like, so if, let's say, bringing in a lamp, you just feel like in your room, okay, this lamp helps me as the teacher to mm-hmm. feel comfortable and calm. Students will pick up on that. Oh, so if I'm in right? my zen, they'll yeah, feel Yeah, they, I, I think they do. And I, and I think, um, like what you all were saying, that, you know, they, they come to the same space every time and they're going to know, okay, this is, this is Mr. Killian's studio. This is how it, it is, you know, and mm-hmm. that type of thing. Um, I think that'll transfer over to your students as well. Yeah. Well, and maybe there's construction in the hallway and there's nothing going right. weird in the studio, but everything that brought them to the studio stressed them out. And so you just need to take two or three minutes and be like, you know what, let's do that breathing thing we did that one time because that construction, gosh, that bothered me too. Okay. 
Now, are we ready to do music? Not yet. Okay, let's do some theory first. Okay, now we're ready. You know, just gauging in the moment. And then if you try to push forward, like Aiden was saying, and it's not working, or you can tell that there's like resistance, but not because they're just being badly behaved because they're like really having a, a trigger or a wall up. Well, stop and talk about it or just redirect. There's nothing wrong with re redirecting five times in a lesson if you need to. Great. Thank you all. I know that um, we are running a little low on time. I know you mentioned that you have one more question. Absolutely. Um, so with this question, I guess, deals mostly with like, I've experienced this with a number of like adolescent boys, like 13 uh, around that age, like saxophone students, actually. It's like all saxophone students. Mm -hmm. I, like, I know like adolescence is a really awkward time for like everybody. Yeah. It was for me. Yeah. And like often people are like, shy or anxious even if they don't have an anxiety disorder yeah hmm. but i found with like a number of these like adolescent boys that there's like i don't know if it's anxiety or if it is some other like neurodivergent thing happening or like a level of like shyness and non-responsive mm -hmm. that seems not normal to me like even if you like were shy like i taught a first lesson this past uh saturday and you know hi how are you doing nothing oh uh how long have you had this horn mm -hmm. books. like just crickets continuously and like so i was like okay i'm just gonna put my horn together not ask questions for a minute mm -hmm. you know and even like as I'm starting to get answers, they're like very like small, One word. short, and it's, and this isn't the first time I've experienced this, like particularly with this age group and sex. Yeah. Um, and I just was like curious if there like is maybe some like common thing there. Is it, is it an anxiety thing? If it is an anxiety thing, how can I like, because I have one student who was like this, and I made no progress. Mm. Like, I made, I mean, they ended up withdrawing. I made no progress with this student because it was just mm. like, all right, mm -hmm. we're in this room, and you might honk on that horn every now and then, and we're not going to say any words to each other because I can't get you to respond to me. Um, it's just like any strategies for, like, dealing with that and like moving forward because like i'm a pretty like loquacious right like, mm -hmm. fun teacher so like kids normally have like no problem okay. talking to me they're not mm -hmm. like hey i love that you love chatting with me but we have mm -hmm. so for me to like i we, I, I don't know how to like move yeah. forward with you. yeah so yeah after teaching like lesson after lesson after lesson and then this one student who just will not participate or respond. Mm -hmm. yeah. you're having to do extra right gymnastics yeah any of y'all have experienced this or have any thoughts on so one thing um and this could work probably for all ages is being as transparent as possible and letting them know what you're gonna do or what you plan to do and asking them if that's okay especially like we're gonna play scales now is that okay with you or i'm gonna play loudly now is that okay with you or ask them what that looks like for them I mean, like what does loud look like to you could you show me and then maybe could i play with you um, and then if you're getting students who won't talk, um, you try to talk through the music. You could just like make a game out of maybe play a little riff and look at them like you're expecting them to respond and see if they do. And if not, then do it again and see if they'll respond musically. Mm -hmm. That's what I would Yeah, think. I was going to say I'm a hyperverbal myself. And so that usually works great. But there are a lot of students, or a few at least, that that's just not them. And I'm like, I don't understand that existence because that's not me. But I understand it's different, and your approach to life is quieter. Okay, and I think when I ask her a question, she's afraid she's gonna get it wrong every time. So I usually just give a longer than I'm comfortable with silence, <laughs> which is really not that long, but you know what I'm talking about. You give 30 seconds and you're like, really, you got nothing for me? If I don't just give you the answer, don't do it. Don't be tempted, you know what I mean? And maybe what that student is showing you through kind of being nonverbal or shutting down is that they don't believe that it's a safe place or that you're going to accept them if they open up. And maybe vulnerability is all that they need to see from you. And so you coming in with boisterous, exciting energy might just feel overwhelming, or they might feel like, I guess they got it covered. I'll just be quiet. 
you know, and that's something that's hard to accept because that's never the energy you're trying to put out. Um, but I think there are different students and different adults that will just be like, you got the energy covered, man. I'll just, I'll just hide over here in the corner. And if they really won't say or do anything, you know, then that's time to invite the parent, the parent in and even bring them into the lesson. Cause I'll have times when after a first or second lesson, even a older student, nine or 10, I'll be like, Hey, you know, let's have mom come in and, and let's show her what we do so that you can do it again at home. And sometimes they're totally different with another person in the room or with a parent. Sometimes that's not, not good. You try it, it did not help. It actually made it worse. So then we let them leave and maybe that opens something up. You know what I mean? Just try varying it as much as you can. I think there's going to be students that resist and there's going to be some times when this is not the right environment and they do withdraw. But you want to be comfortable in the knowledge that you did everything you knew how to do to try and help them and offer them all the tools. And then if they didn't want to use them, that really is up to them. You know, so I think, too, I know for me, sometimes it's where I'll start with music listening together. You know, maybe there is a YouTube saxophone video you can watch together, you know, and just kind of be together in that space watching it. You know, you're kind of observing them. Do they seem to be into it or are they not into it? You know, watching body language, that type of thing. Um, And just kind of, I think, taking time to build that. I know we keep going back to this, but build that relationship through the music. So that music listening can be a very non-threatening way of sharing that with them. So it's not like you're playing for them or they're having to play for you, but it's just you're just listening together. Yeah. And so the other thing, and then maybe from there, maybe it can be, I mean, totally thinking outside the box here, but maybe, you know, you play saxophone and can they just kind of tap the beat on a small drum? So they're, they're making the music with you, but it's not, okay, now play this scale for me, you know, type thing, but you're kind of gradually getting them into, and, and meanwhile, I think you're, it's like you're planting a seed and then you're watering it. Can you're building that confidence slowly and yeah. surely. And then hopefully. Yeah. I mean, you never you know, know the, the guys that age might be intimidated by you and just think they could never measure up. Mm-hmm. And you're like, what? Wow. And I think that I don't age in particular, yeah, it's just, but it could you're be so that, unsure of yourself. Especially and, when you demo your skills, like yeah. it's meant to be confidence inspiring. Like, yes, I can teach you, listen to me. But then sometimes I think they're like, well, I'll never play like that. I may as well not even try. And you don't know that inner dialogue is happening. Right. You know, yeah. something is happening. That's all I'm getting is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. right, right. But, right, right, right. Okay. But yeah. they're, I was going to say, they're, it's probably not about you. Which right. is the hardest thing to accept because in the moment you feel like you're just failing or like they hate you. <laughs> like, I didn't even do anything. How could I have done it wrong? Um, but maybe it's they're just so in their head or in their, you know, emotions about whatever is going on. Maybe not even about the lesson. Maybe my mom forced me to be here and I don't even want to be here. And she drove me here and she was yelling at me the whole way. Mm-hmm. And now I'm in this quiet room with this person I don't know. So just I'm just going to sit here. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Like, Absolutely. Like, decide, it, it's hard to know. Like, isn't yeah. that... Right. They're just shutting down and they're protesting the experience. Sometimes, or probably. Like, have I just taken on a student who is like nonverbal? Yeah. As like when I, the way they exist. That's so what I was going like, to say. I can't like, I'm like, how do I feel this out? When, I've, like, when I've had a student out. who's totally not like, uh, I have an older student uh, I see on Saturdays. He's in his 20s and he has autism and he's lightly verbal. I will say that he will respond verbally at times, but he needs a specific understanding of the response that I want. So if I ask a yes or no question, he will say yes if he feels good about it. He will say nothing if he doesn't like it. He doesn't say no. I don't know why, (laughs) but he just doesn't say it. So I will give him options of an answer. So maybe we're working on rhythms and I'll be like, which one is the quarter note? This one or this one on a flashcard? He can identify it right away because images are no problem for him, but he doesn't always want to say it. So he'll point to the correct one and I'll say, great, say quarter note. And he'll be like, I said, say it loud, quarter note. Great. Good job. And then we'll go to the next one. And then maybe he doesn't really seem like he's like, I'm having to really work to get him to do that. My verbal feels hard for him today. That's fine. Let's just go to his normal warm-ups or let's pull out that game on the iPad that always brings him to life. You know what I mean? Maybe the introduction of just something electronic like a video or a game will be the link. Because, I mean, unfortunately, we're all addicted to that these days. So maybe they just need to know that, like, they can still be themselves even when they're in that room with you, especially at the beginning. 
and I have a very, very shy student. I just want to encourage you. And I thought, this student is not really enjoying enjoying this experience because they're so shy. Like yeah. there yeah. was just, like you said, no response. And then, so I was bringing the child to the car and I was just talking to the mom and I was like, she did so, she does so well. Like, you know, but she just seemed a little like quiet today. And she says, oh, you know, the time is, is early and she's not a morning person, but she loves piano. She mm -hmm. comes, she's so excited to be here. She talks about it nonstop <laughs> so when she's in the way. car. <laughs> and I went, oh, okay, yeah. great. And so that just made me feel like, okay, it's not, like you said, it's not me, it's not, it. but the time at eight o'clock in the morning is a little early for my child, but this is when the parents wanted the lesson because they have their whole day and there's all these little, there's all these little nuances going on, but, and she doesn't speak very, like you said, it's like pulling teeth to get her to tell me a complete sentence, but she loves it. Yeah, she yeah. loves it. Yeah. You know, so just to encourage you yeah, in so that, yeah. there's a lot right. going it's, on that we don't know. It's hard not to take it personally. And it's hard not to take yes, it. Is. But you it know really what? They are getting something they from are. you. And at the yeah. end of the day, if they keep coming week after week yeah. in their own time, that shows you by action that this is something that that they are invested in. You know, I had, you made me think of it. I had a student one time who. Um, uh, on the spectrum and pretty much nonverbal, but and when he first started, he wanted nothing to do with me, <laughs> you know. And I was like, "Oh my gosh!" And the parents are in the room, and um, so the first I I remember I played music back to back. I got my guitar and I just you know and <laughs> played music back to back for a little while. And I mean, and I was like, "Oh my god, what am I doing?" You know, like this isn't working. And but he, he kept coming. His parents and it was so funny. After one, his, the parents came out and they were like we just love the way you work with our son. And in my head, I'm like, what are we doing? You know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, um, but it just, he was a person who just, he didn't trust new people easily. He didn't like, he just needed lots and lots of time to just know, okay, this person, you know, isn't, yeah, exactly. And, and then gradually, okay, so then eventually, I could face him doing some music. I mean, this is a very severe, you know, case, but um, but gradually we got there. I'm actually still working with him years later, you know, and so but, but just to encourage, like the it's, baby I, steps are so the small baby sometimes. Step, they're, 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 they're feel big like to them, you you're know? not making it anywhere. It does. But I would say even that's yeah. in that with Drew, you never know what impression you made on them. Maybe right. now they're in school band. And they're like because that, you that one thing that that teacher said. I remember that. You wouldn't, may never see them or hear about any of that again, but just know that like your presence makes an impact mm -hmm. and your effort is seen, even if you don't get the feedback on it. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah, I want to thank all of our panelists again for being here today. Uh, we could probably talk all yeah. morning and afternoon. Yeah. It's super fun. Hopefully these are some conversations that we can continue on campus when we see each other yeah. and as these um, topics arise.